I was raised to believe that the Bible defines good and evil for us within its pages. But when we stop and examine this idea using the Bible, we discover something else. In the Garden of Eden, there were two trees. A tree that would bring life to all who ate of its fruit, and a tree that brought death. And it was the second tree, the tree that resulted in death, that contained the knowledge of good and evil. Have we been deceived by the serpent who is trying to get us to eat of the second tree? Is the Bible really trying to define good and evil for us? Let's take a step back. Let's run an experiment. Instead of seeking to define good and evil, let's instead ask the question of the trees. Let's attempt to define life and death, but to do so, we must first seek it out. So join us as we Deresh Chai, as we seek life. Hey everybody, welcome to the Deresh Chai Experiment, the show where we take the warnings of Scripture seriously in order to attempt to avoid the fallout of living according to human nature. Last week we began a discussion of the topic of blessings and curses, this fifth section of the Suzerain Vassal Treaty that we have encountered in this book. For two whole chapters, Deuteronomy outlined what these blessings and cursings entailed. The blessings we saw were characterized by life. You would bring forth many children and not suffer miscarriage. Your land would bring forth crops in abundance. Your animals would be bountiful and plentiful. Everything of life that you own will be fruitful and bountiful, and this will bring you wealth. You will be victorious in battle, preserving the lives of your countrymen. Wonderful rewards, and these rewards were to be given for obedience to God. And let's not forget that the book of Deuteronomy is where we find the clearest and earliest use of the idea of God as king. In Genesis, he was creator. In Exodus, he was husband. In Leviticus, he was God. In Numbers, he was father. But here in Deuteronomy, we find that Hashem is depicted as king of kings and lord of lords, the one who rules over the nation of Israel. And the commands that are presented here are the decrees and the instructions of the high king to his vassals. And just as with any other government, the promise is that if you obey, if you are a good citizen, then you will be rewarded with peace and prosperity. But disobedience, Disobedience brings a curse, and those curses are presented as a direct contrast to the blessings. And while the blessings are not spoken of in any great detail, chapter 28 spent quite some time delving into the specifics of what these curses would entail. Not just you will reap death and barrenness in your families, crops and herds, and you will suffer defeat at the hands of your enemies. But the full implications of these curses are described in depth to a level of detail that I don't feel the need to repeat this week. And when we encounter these curses, we cringe. How could God curse his own people to the point of scattering them to the four winds, essentially disowning them? That would be like a government purposefully surrendering to an enemy and allowing their citizens to suffer at the hands of the others. Now surely we should only expect good from the hand of God. Surely he will protect us from all harm from those outside his kingdom. And yet, when we consider the role of not just a king, but a high king, we discover that it is the role of a government to punish those who disobey. And in the case of a nation that is in covenant with a high king, it is his duty to destroy those that rebel. We caught sight of this in Genesis 14 with the war of the five kings versus the four kings. Ketileomer using other nations and kings to destroy those kings and nations that had rebelled against him. Alongside this, in every nation in the world, disobedience to the laws of the nation brings a penalty, the purpose of the penalty being threefold. First, to warn others who might be contemplating an act of disobedience as a protective measure from future rebellion to cause them to fear in order to stop the potential perpetrator and cause them to contemplate whether the risk is worth the perceived reward of this negative action. The second reason being, in the cases that do not warrant the penalty of death, to rehabilitate the perpetrator, to cause them to come to a place of repentance for the evil that they have done, and then to decide to return to a life of obedience to the law of the land. And the third reason for these curses is to bring some sense of justice to the victims of the various crimes committed. 
And when we examine the blessings and curses this week, we will find two of these reasons present in the purpose and desired outcome for the curses of Deuteronomy, as they are described here. We have seen God's justice and care for victims on display over and over. But this Parsha then discusses two other types of men. The one who hears and does not fear, but continues in his course. And the one who reaches a point of rehabilitation, who is then allowed to return to full citizenship of the kingdom. So let's turn to Deuteronomy 29, and as we read this week's Parsha, really focus on these two types of men and the outcome that are described for them. Deuteronomy 29, 1 through 30, verse 14. These are the words of the covenant which Hashem commanded Moshe to make with the children of Israel in the land of Moab besides the covenant which he made with them in Chorev. And Moshe called Israel and said to them, You yourselves saw all that Hashem did before your eyes in the land of Mitzrayim, to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land. Your eyes saw the great trials, the signs, and those great wonders. But Hashem has not given you a heart to know and eyes to see and ears to hear till this day. And I have led you forty years in the wilderness. Your garments have not worn out on you, and your sandals have not worn out on your feet. And you ate no bread, and drank no wine, nor strong drink, so that you might know that I am Hashem your God. And when you came to this place, Sichon the king of Heshbon and Og the king of Bashan came out against us to battle, and we struck them, and took their land, and gave it as an inheritance to the Ravenites, to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh. Therefore you shall guard the words of this covenant to do them, so that you prosper in all that you do. All of you are standing today before Hashem, your Elohim, your leaders, your tribes, your elders, and your officers, all the men of Israel, your little ones, your wives, and your sojourner who is in the midst of your camp, from the one who cuts your wood to the one who draws your water, so that you should enter into covenant with Hashem, your Elohim, and into his oath which Hashem, your Elohim, makes with you today in order to establish you today as a people for himself, and he himself be your God, as he has spoken to you, and as he has sworn to your fathers, to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov. And not with you alone I am making this covenant and this oath, but with him who stands here with us today before Hashem our Elohim, as well as with him who is not here with us today. For you know how we dwelt in the land of Mitzrayim, and how we passed through the nations which you passed through, and you saw their abominations and their idols, wood and stone, silver and gold, which were with them. Lest there should be among you a man or woman or clan or tribe whose heart turns away today from Hashem our Elohim to go and to serve the gods of these nations, lest there should be among you a root bearing bitterness or wormwood. And it shall be when he hears the word of this curse that he shall bless himself in his heart, saying, I have peace, though I walk in the stubbornness of my heart, in order to add drunkenness to thirst. Hashem would not forgive him, but rather the displeasure of Hashem and his jealousy shall burn against that man, and every curse that is written in this book shall settle on him, and Hashem shall blot out his name from under the heavens. And Hashem shall separate him for evil out of all of the tribes of Israel, according to all the curses of the covenant that are written in this book of the Torah. And the generation to come of your children who rise up after you, and the foreigner who comes from a far land, shall say when they see the plagues of that land, and the sickness which Hashem has sent into it. All of its land is sulfur, salt, and burning. It is not sown, nor does it bear, nor does any grass grow there, like the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah, Adma and Zavoyim, which Hashem overthrew in his displeasure and his wrath. And all the nations shall say, Why has Hashem done so to this land? What does the heat of his great displeasure mean? And it shall be said, Because they have forsaken the covenant of Hashem Elohim of their fathers, which he made with them when he brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim. And they went and served other mighty ones and bowed themselves to them, mighty ones that they did not know, and that he had not given to them. Therefore the displeasure of Hashem burned against this land, to bring on it every curse that was written in this book. And Hashem uprooted them from their land in displeasure and in wrath and in great rage, and cast them into another land as it is today. The secret matters belong to Hashem our God, but what is revealed belongs to us and to our children forever, to do all the words of this Torah. And it shall be when all these words come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you, and you shall bring them back to your heart among all the nations where Hashem your God drives you. 
and shall turn back to Hashem your God and obey his voice according to all that I command you today, with all your heart and with all your being, you and your children. Then Hashem your God shall turn back your captivity and shall have compassion on you, and he shall turn back and gather you from all the peoples where Hashem your God has scattered you. If any of you are driven out to the farthest parts under the heavens, from there Hashem your God does gather you, and from there he does take you. And Hashem your Elohim shall bring you to the land which your fathers possessed, and you shall possess it, and he shall do good to you, and increase you more than your fathers. And Hashem your Elohim shall circumcise your heart and the heart of your seed, to love Hashem your Elohim with all your heart and with all your soul, so that you might live. And Hashem your Elohim shall put all these curses on your enemies and on those who hate you and persecuted you. And you shall turn back and obey the voice of Hashem and do all his commands which I command you today. And Hashem your Elohim shall make you have excess in all the work of your hand, in the fruit of your body, and in the fruit of your livestock, and the fruit of your ground for good. For Hashem turns back to rejoice over you for good as he rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey the voice of Hashem your Elohim to guard his commands and his laws, which are written in the book of the Torah, if you turn back to Hashem your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being, for this command which I am commanding you today, it is not too hard for you, nor is it far off. It is not in the heavens to say, Who shall ascend into heavens for us, and bring it to us, and cause us to hear it, so that we do it? Nor is it beyond the sea to say, Who shall go over the sea for us, to bring it to us, to cause us to hear it, so that we do it. For the word is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, to do it. So when you pick up a commentary on the book of Deuteronomy, one of the most widely recognized facts of the book is that it is mentioned in nearly every commentary is that this book is a series of anywhere from 3 to 11 speeches that are given by Moses. The most obvious way to split these speeches is to recognize when the text takes a break to provide a bit of narrative. And when we do this, we end up with a total of four speeches, not counting the blessings in the final chapter. Uh, the first speech spans from verse 6 in the first chapter of the book to the end of chapter 4. Then in verse 41 of chapter 4, we read of Moses separating out cities of refuge to be placed on the east side of the Jordan in the land that was already allotted to the tribes of Reuben, Gad, and half of Manasseh. Then in chapter 5, the second speech begins, and this second speech lasts the entirety of the legal portion of the book, including the blessings and curses laid out in the last two chapters, from chapter 5, verse 1, to 28, verse 68. And as we open chapter 29 of Deuteronomy this week, we encounter yet another bit of narrative, the break that signifies the end of the second speech and the beginning of the third. Now, this third speech will only take us to the end of chapter 30 before we encounter the next break in the text. The fourth speech then begins in verse 2 of chapter 31 and continues through the end of Ha'azinu, or the Song of Moses, as it's sometimes called in chapter 32. After this, we read of the final blessing that Moses places over the tribes of Israel before his death. And while this section is spoken by Moses, it's not really considered a speech or, or a sermon as the other sections are often considered. It is his blessing. It's a similar thing to what Jacob did on his own deathbed over his sons in Genesis chapter 49. This time, not a blessing of a father to sons, but rather a blessing of leader to the tribes. But this week we're in chapter 29, so let's return. As this third speech opens, Moses once again speaks of the history that Israel has had with Hashem, something that was a large part of the first speech, the miracles of Egypt, events which Israel is described as having seen with their own eyes, but which we know that the second generation did not actually witness, except for the oldest members of the community, and them only in their very early years. And this verse serves as yet another reminder that every person from every generation is to think of themselves as having been present for the events surrounding the Passover. Then Moses reminds them of the 40 years in the wilderness with Hashem providing for their basic necessities, then followed by the victories against Sihon and Og. This opening serves as a reminder of the history of Hashem in Israel and the way that Hashem has provided for Israel as their king. He provided their basic necessities food, clothing, and protection from the elements and enemies. But this time in the wilderness is also steeped as a training regimen. You ate not bread and you drank no strong drink during this time in order to prove that I am Hashem, your God. 
your king who cares for your needs even in the most inhospitable of environments. Training in faith that Hashem is capable of protecting and providing. Training that he will ensure success in what he commands to be done. But now you are no longer in training. Israel is entering into a new phase of their existence. They are about to encounter the world once again. And in the face of battle, in the face of riches, in the face of a powerful enemy, it will be all too easy for the people to forget their history and to turn away from their training. History is rife with stories of this sort. Soldiers who forget their training when faced with overwhelming odds. The truth is that it does not take a whole lot to rout an army. The only thing that can cause an army to remain firm in the face of overwhelming odds or great fear is training. How many war movies have you seen with soldiers sitting in fear getting their final prep talk by their commander just before contact with their enemy and nearly every one of the commander will say, remember your training. And that is what training is for. It creates muscle memory in a person so that they will continue to act in a certain way even when faced with immense stress or fear. And for the people of Israel, this training regimen was the wilderness and the accompanying battles that they had already fought. They had defeated an entire nation which has 12,000 soldiers and without a single casualty. They had defeated nations of giants in Heshbon and Bashan. They had already faced fear and seen great victory. But it is not just fear of the enemy that can cause an army to melt away. Greed and lust can also destroy an army. An army that has momentum towards victory, especially after a significant event such as breaching a city's walls or overcoming an entrenchment, can become overconfident. All too often an overconfident army will turn to looting, raping, and pillaging before the victory is secured. There are, again, countless stories in the historical record of men turning to loot or turning to rape just after entering a city that had been breached. These soldiers becoming distracted by greed or lust while still under threat from an active enemy bent on their destruction. And if men under threat from an active enemy can succumb to such temptations, then how much more of people who live in safety and security? Once again, it is only a strong field commander, but even better, proper training that can limit these occurrences. And so in verse 9, we read this admonition. Guard all of the words of this covenant so that you prosper. And it is not just the men, not just the warriors. It is everyone in the community from the greatest to the small, from the leaders to the water bearers. Everyone is entering into this covenant not just the important people. In verse 13, this is because everyone is being established as part of this new nation. Everyone is being established as a citizen, and everyone is being held to the standards being set forth in this covenant. You see, with other suzerain vassal treaties of the day, the treaty was made only between the leaders of the two nations involved, the high king and the vassal king. The subjects of the two nations, they weren't really involved in the treaty in any real way, and very little was expected of them. But this treaty is being made not between God and the leaders of Israel, but between God and every person who belongs to Israel, from the native-born to the friendly foreigner, all the way down to their servants and slaves. Every individual in Israel was to enter into this covenant and to take the oath of allegiance to Hashem as king. Every person then becomes their own vassal to the high king, a king in their own right over everything that they have been granted to rule over by their king. And in verse 14, we read that this covenant is being made with everyone, including some who are not present there on the plains of Shittim. Again, we find this idea that the events of Israel and Hashem are not limited to the people of the generation that was present for these events. The second generation and all subsequent generations were to view the events of the Exodus as having happened to them. Likewise, the covenant that is being cut is not just with those who are alive at the time of this covenant. It is also with those who would come after and join themselves to the covenant in later generations and dates. And the reason for this allegiance and loyalty is because you remember the abominations of Egypt, the idols and their gods. And it was these gods that caused Egypt to enslave you. 
Today it would be said, you remember your enslavement to sin and death. You remember the bondage that you were in to money or fame or sex. And so remember this, lest it happen again that a member of the community of Israel turn from Hashem back to the bondage under other gods, and their heart be filled with bitterness, or in my translation, wormwood. And then the text stops and describes what this type of man looks like. This man of bitterness and wormwood, or perhaps more accurately, venom and poison. This is the man who is part of the covenant, he hears the words of this curse, but he looks around him and he doesn't see any part of the curse in action in his own life. In fact, all he sees is peace, wealth, and pleasure. And he recognizes that he is not being punished for his own disobedience to the covenant, and so he assumes that he is immune. And so he adds drunkenness to his thirst. An idiom that describes a person who chooses to add the indulgence of a desire to the desire. And if we consider it, a man who is thirsty can indulge in several ways. He can choose water and actually make a difference in his thirst. Or he could choose alcohol or some other drink. And while this solution is more pleasurable, the end result is that the thirst is not actually quenched. The sort of man who has signed on to the covenants of Israel, but then becomes hard-hearted and returns to his sin and then looks around himself and he sees only peace. This man who then doubles down on his sin because he no longer believes that God punishes disobedience. This man who ceases to believe in accountability before God will be held accountable before Hashem. And when you encounter a man such as this, it is incumbent on Israel to separate the sort of man out from the whole and to exile him from the community. A stance that we see Paul take on several occasions, the most famous being found in 1 Corinthians 5, 1-2. It is commonly reported that there is whoring among you, and such whoring as is not even named among the nations, so as one to have his father's wife. And you have been puffed up and did not rather mourn, so that he who has done this deed be removed from among you. In another place, Peter speaks on this situation in this way. 2 Peter 2, 20-22 For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of the Master and Savior Yeshua the Messiah, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn from the holy command delivered unto them. For them the proverb has proved true. A dog returns to his own vomit, and a washed sow returns to a rolling in the mud. Peter likens a person who comes into covenant with Hashem, who then returns to a life of sin and indulgence to an animal. And not just an animal, an unclean animal. A man who looks around and concludes that God does not in fact punish those who act on desire and instinct is not just an animal. But he's an animal or even an unclean animal, but even further than that. He's an animal that had had his problem solved, but who then returned to the source of that problem. And when these curses come upon you, Moses implies in verse 22. You see, there's no doubt in the mind of Moses that Israel will get to the place of being on the receiving end of these curses. And when these curses come upon you, later generations will wonder at the destruction that Hashem has wrought in Israel. The land that was once flowing with bounty will become like the plains of the Dead Sea barren and dead, unable to support life in any real way. And they will compare the end of Israel to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, a people who had become so corrupt as to require swift and sudden judgment from God. And Israel will become a sign in the proverb to the nations. And the conclusion of the proverb, the lesson to learn from it, these people are cursed because they forsook the covenant of their God and King. They rebelled and turned to serving other gods, and they resorted to placing urges and instincts as their guide. And so because they turned from the covenant, they have fallen under the curse of their covenant. And the fact of the matter is that, as we have talked about last week, these curses occurred in the history of Israel on three separate occasions. The first with the northern kingdom of Israel when Assyria conquered them and took them into captivity. The second when Babylon conquered the southern kingdom of Israel and took them into exile, a defeat that was highlighted by the destruction of the first temple. 
the third being in 70 CE and culminating with the defeat of the Bar Kokhba rebellion and the exile of Israel by Rome in 135 CE. And because of the historical fulfillments of these curses, many assume that the curses are no more and have passed away. But we discovered last week that the events described in the book of Revelation, they are based on these curses. These curses are still current and future in the world as we know it. They have not passed away. They are then, but they are also now, and they will continue to be. And so the warning is still relevant. Don't look around you and see the prosperity of those who are wicked and assume that God no longer punishes wickedness. Instead, remember your instructions. Remember your training and stay true to your king and his covenant. He is faithful. He will do what he says, and this wilderness experience is the time that you can look back on to validate this promise. And the final verse of this chapter is one that should give us all pause. The things that have been revealed, the evil that we can prove, we are responsible for dealing with that evil. He has given instructions on just how to do that. We are to act in justice when we encounter transgression of the covenant. That is our role and our right as members of the kingdom. But for those things that are hidden, the things that cannot be proven, we are to trust in Hashem for Him to bring justice in these situations. And this should sober us. Human justice systems should actually engage in justice. They should not accept bribes or favor a person simply because of their popularity or punish a person simply because of their poverty. And what do we see when we look out in the world today? The exact opposite. The rich and the famous get away with terrible evils, and those who are from the slums, well, they suffer the greatest punishment. Justice is not truly served. Our justice system is broken. We are not doing our part of taking care of the things that have been revealed for us to deal with. But it's not us individually. As an individual, there's not much that we can do. It's our society. It's our culture. It's our way of life that's broken. It no longer serves the people. It serves the rich, the famous, and the popular. Or, as is becoming popular today, it serves the poor and the victim mentality. And these warnings, they, they haven't been taken to heart. There are plenty who have succumbed to this way of thinking. Chances are that you know a person like this. If God does not punish sinners, then why should we? In fact, why should we avoid sin in our own lives? Instead, we should celebrate sin. We should add drunkenness to our thirst. We should indulge in our desires and our instincts. This is the first type of person being addressed in this chapter. The one who does not hearken to the words of instruction or the warnings that are contained therein. But the Torah speaks of two types of reaction in those who hear of these curses, and we encounter the second in chapter 30. When the blessing and the curse come upon you and you recognize that the difficulties that you face are the result of your own faithlessness, when you face the fact of your own failure and that you have engaged in the sins that bring cursing, you will repent. You will turn back to Hashem and obey Him. You will return to the covenant of Hashem. And when you do, the curses that you are experiencing will be reversed. Hashem will have compassion on you. He will demonstrate His mercy and rescue you from the result of your sins. And He will gather you from the bondage that you are in, and He will bring you back. And it doesn't matter how far you have gone. It doesn't matter how far you have strayed. When you repent, you will be brought back to return to the promise that Hashem has made to those who are part of His covenant. And in verse 6, we find it once again. Hashem will circumcise your heart. Not a New Testament idea. And throughout Scripture, we see this idea of a circumcised heart set in opposition to the idea of stubbornness and an unwillingness to bend. The stubborn man being the one who continues in his sin despite the warning. The man of a circumcised heart that repents and allows correction and counsel to humble him. And what do we find as the result of a circumcised heart? You will love Hashem your God with all your heart and all your soul. A concept that from one end of scripture to the other is demonstrated through obedience. 
Deuteronomy 11.1 1. And you shall love Hashem your God and guard his charge, even his laws and his judgments and his commands always. John 14.21-24 He who possesses my commands and guards them is he who loves me, and he who loves me shall be loved by my Father, and I shall love him and manifest myself to him. Now Judah, not the one from Kiriot, said to him, Master, what has come about that you are about to manifest yourself to us and not to the world? And Yeshua answered him and said, If anyone loves me, he shall guard my word, and my father shall love him, and we shall come to him and make our stay with him. He who does not love me does not guard my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but of the father who sent me. Or John 15.10, If you guard my commands, you shall stay in my love, even as I have guarded my Father's commands and stay in his love. Or 1 John 5.3, For this is the love of God, that we guard his commands, and his commands are not heavy, because everyone, having been born of God, overcomes the world, and this is the overcoming that has overcome the world, our faith. Throughout scripture, we discover this idea. Love of God in the Bible is accomplished through obedience to what he commands. Ernest Kevin, the first principal of the London Bible College, said in his 1991 book, Moral Law, quote, The bestowal of the power for a holy life needs to be accompanied by instructions in the pattern of it. And what does sanctified behavior consist? It consists in pleasing God. And what is it that pleases God? The doing of his will. And where is his will to be discerned? In his holy law. The law, then, is the Christian rule of life, and the believer finds that he delights in the law of God after the inward man. Romans 7.22 The Christian is not lawless, but is under the law of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9.21 We are called to act in holiness. We are warned against lawlessness. We are commanded to love God first and foremost above all else, and that love is accomplished in this way. We do what Hashem has instructed his subjects and the citizens of his kingdom to do, not out of a sense of duty or rule-keeping or self-righteousness, rather out of love. And the result of this circumcised heart and love for God? Verse 6, so that you might live. Life is the result the word that defines the blessings of chapter 28. And when you repent of your wickedness and return to Hashem and begin to act in the ways that he has instructed, then these curses that are described will be put on those who have persecuted you and those who hate you. And when you return, you will have excess in the lives that belong to you, the fruit of your body, the fruit of your livestock, and the fruit of your crop. You will experience the blessing as described but only if you hearken to these commands and do them as an act of love towards Hashem. And in verse 11, we read a passage that flies in the face of what many Christians claim to be the reason why we needed Yeshua in the first place. These commands that Hashem has given, they are not too difficult for you to do. They are not in the heavens or beyond the sea, these being idioms for they are not a mystery that can only be sought out and understood by a few. These commands are plain, and they are simple, and they are written so that everyone can understand them. They are not too difficult to perceive, and they are not indiscernible. The immature can read them and obey them out of fear of Hashem, which is the beginning of wisdom. The immature can keep these commands as a list of rules that are meant to be checked off as children. But the purpose of this Torah is to train a person into maturity so that they can begin to keep the commands according to their underlying principles. As Paul says, the Torah is a tutor. It trains the simple. But when you reach the maturity level of no longer needing a tutor, they become a guide. Not to be forgotten and tossed away, but to be a guide to the greater promise than the Torah, the Messiah. You see, the Torah describes Messiah within its pages, and that's something that I hope that I have impressed upon you throughout these last three years. A man that did not need to ascend into heaven or across a sea in order to retrieve the instructions from God, 
Rather, a man who was born that could demonstrate just what obedience to the Torah means and what it looks like. A man who then, as a reward for his obedience, was granted the blessing of eternal life, who then ascended into heaven as part of that reward. He didn't come to give new instructions, but to give greater insight into the current instructions to all who cared to look. He described how to live life according to the perfect Torah of Hashem. Yeshua did not come to keep the Torah because we were incapable. Yeshua came to demonstrate that the Torah is not kept according to obedience according to the flesh. But the Torah is kept according to the Spirit, the underlying principles that we can extrapolate into our own lives. It is not too far off. It is in your heart. It is in your mind now because you have read it. It is near to you, a fact that is even more true today than it was in the day that these words were written. We each have our own copy. In fact, many of us have multiple copies. John even repeats this idea in the passage that we just read. I'll even read it in a different translation just to prove that this is not a figment of translator bias. 1 John 5, 3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commands are not burdensome. A sentiment that Yeshua repeated as well, Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30 Come to me, all you who labor and are burdened, and I shall give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. For my yoke is gentle and my burden is light. But if this is the case, then why does Paul state this in Galatians 5, 1 through 3? For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. Look, I, Paul, say to you that if you accept circumcision, Christ will be of no advantage to you. I testify again to every man who accepts circumcision that he is obligated to keep the whole law. In this passage, Paul seems to state that the circumcision of the flesh is a burden to any who would accept it. And circumcision is part of the law. In fact, if you seek out circumcision according to Torah, then you are obliged to keep the entire Torah. See right there, the law is a burden. We shouldn't attempt to live according to the Torah because we will become obligated to keep the whole thing. What a burden. And again, in Acts 15, we read a similar thing in Acts 15.10. Now then, why do you try God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? And who was this spoken to? Once again, it's addressed to the circumcision party. But we must stop and ask ourselves, what is it that is the burden? Is it circumcision in itself? Is it Torah? You see, we miss something in this context that would have been painfully obvious to the original audience. In the first century, the idea of circumcision encompassed a whole process of ritual proselyte conversion. And ritual proselyte conversion then obligated a person to keep all of the traditions that had been crafted by the sages and rabbis. Undergoing circumcision in this way was to place yourself under the authority of these sages and rabbis. It is this that is the heavy burden. Luke eleven forty six, and he said, Woe to you also, you learned in the Torah, because you load men with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not touch the burdens with one of your fingers. Or Matthew 23, 1 through 4, Then Yeshua spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on the seat of Moses. Therefore, whatever they say to you to guard, guard and do. But do not do according to their works, for they say and they do not do. For they bind heavy burdens and hard to bear and lay them on men's shoulders, but with their finger they do not wish to move them. In both cases, it is the rabbis that are loading the people with heavy burdens, not the law of God. In fact, if you study out the traditions of the Jews, you will quickly find that the traditions that they have built upon the Torah are indeed quite burdensome. They are extremely restrictive, and they prevent those who live under their authority from truly experiencing the freedom that is described by the Torah. In fact, if we look other places in Scripture, it is never once the law of God that is described as a burden or as a heavy weight. Instead, it is sin, it is transgression of the law, that is described in this way. Amos 2, 
and I raised up some of your sons as prophets and some of your men as Nazarites. Not so. O you children of Israel, declares Hashem. But you made the Nazarites drink wine and commanded the prophets, saying, Do not prophesy. See, I am weighed down by you as a wagon is weighed down when filled with sheaves. Or Psalm 38, 4. For my crookednesses have passed over my head like a heavy burden, too heavy for me. Lamentations 1, 14. The yoke of my transgression has been bound by his hand, woven together and thrust upon my neck. He has made my strength stumble. Hashem has given me into the hands which I am unable to withstand. Now this was written as the curses of Deuteronomy were coming upon Judah after the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. Or Luke 21.34 And take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down by gluttony and drunkenness and worries of this life, and that day come upon you suddenly. Or Second Timothy 3, 6 through 7 For among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sin, led away by various lusts, always learning but never able to come to the knowledge of truth. Nowhere else in Scripture is righteousness or obedience to the law of God called a burden. And yet in Galatians we assume that this is the meaning of the text because it is set in opposition to circumcision. But we don't understand the context associated with circumcision. Because if the act of circumcision was so terrible, then why did Paul circumcise Timothy in Acts 16, after the Jerusalem Council? It was not the act that Paul was against. It was the associated obligations that went with circumcision by Jewish authorities that was the problem. And when you understand what this term stands for, for a person participating in a change of flesh in order to become a Jew for the purpose of salvation, then you discover what Paul was truly railing against. Not against the law of God against a law that had been created by men and had replaced the law of God in the society of the Jews. It is this that is the burden. It is this that the Galatians had been freed from. No one need change their nationality in order to be saved. In fact, changing your nationality for that purpose is a good way to ensure that you will drift further from salvation. But the law of God is not a burden. Rather, it is life and blessing It is as Paul says in Romans 7, verse 12, so that the Torah is truly holy and the command holy and righteous and good. But the statement is true that those who enter into the kingdom of God, those who pledge their allegiance to the high king Yeshua, those who live according to the law of the kingdom, according to love. Galatians 3, 13. Messiah has redeemed us from the curse of the Torah, having become a curse for us. For it has been written, Cursed is everyone who hangs upon a tree. And what do we read is necessary to be redeemed from the curse of the law? It's right here in Deuteronomy. Repentance. Return to Hashem and His ways. So yes, indeed, Yeshua has redeemed us from the curse of the law. No longer do we need to suffer under that other law, that law of sin and death. No longer do we need to wallow in the bondage to other gods and nations. No longer do we need to live in fear of punishment or curse from God. For we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. And today, just as then, it starts with repentance. So don't harden your hearts as you look around the world and you see the wicked prospering. Don't for once believe that they will escape when the day comes. For God will be faithful and just. And Revelation reveals that the curse is not yet gone from the world. These curses will be poured out on earth by God's agents. But we, we can be free of the curse of death. We can be free of sin. We can be free of bondage to the flesh and its desires. For we are a new creation, and new creation is life. So seek life in all that you do. And remember your training. Deresh Chai. Shalom. Thank you for tuning in to Deresh Chai. If this content has blessed you and you would like more, please consider subscribing, liking, commenting, and sharing with others. To find out more about what we do and to support this ministry, head over to seeklifesc.com. 
That's SeekLifeSC.com. We'll see you again next time as we dare Shai, as we seek life. Shalom.